All right, good morning. My name is Judy Herman, and I've been teaching for Drexel since 1991, and I don't want to know how many of you were in kindergarten then. Um, but it is a great course that we're going to be offering you for the next five days. Um, just a couple of ground rules, and first of all, I think what's a little different about studying for NCLEX, you've all made it through a nursing program. You've all, or just about made it, or you're close to making it. And what you want to think about now is not filling your brain with a lot of content, but what you really want to start thinking about is what kind of questions can they ask about that content. And so I'm going to ask you to think of that question as we go through. We're really going to focus on what kind of questions can they ask about this topic, and what kind of nursing priorities and what kind of nursing decision making addresses each of the topics that we're going to talk about. We're going to go through topics very quickly. Um, just for an example, we're going to cover the entire cardiovascular system and all of its nursing care in 60 minutes. So um, obviously, this is going to be a rudimentary look at some of the content. What I ask you to also think about are gray areas or muddy areas as we're going through, areas that you're not quite sure about. When you get to those areas, you want to make yourself a notation. Put a star next to it, circle it, highlight it. And that's the material you're going to want to go back and study. This book has everything you need to really give yourself a good review and overview of the NCLEX content. That does not mean every piece of content is in it, but it does mean that there's a lot of information in this book. So I'm going to talk as we go about when you get to an area that is rough for you. If you don't remember all the liver enzymes when a patient it is in cirrhosis and, and what those enzymes look, at, look like, circle it or put a star next to it so you can go back and then study that material. In each unit, we're going to pause a little bit and I'm going to give you time to do a couple of the questions in the back of each chapter. Then we'll also go back and discuss those questions, so hopefully that'll help you. One of the things that you'll want to think about while you're doing test questions, and really, if you remember back to when you learned to do blood pressures, one of the things that you learned is that you have to take a lot of blood pressures before you get good at it. And it's the same thing with nursing and NCLEX questions. You have to do a lot of questions before you get to master the skill. So after these five days, you'll be able to go back in the back of the book and look at some of the practice tests. And I really recommend that you do that. So we're going to keep it as informal as we possibly can in this setting. If you have a question, just raise your hand. If I don't see your hand, because I'm not sure I see all of you real well, then make sure you just say something, because we really do want to get your feedback, and we want to hear what your questions are. Remember, your questions are probably the same questions that are held by a couple of other people. So let's get started. If you could open up your book to the section on adult nursing, we're going to talk about multi-system stressors. And we're going to talk about this and for about an hour. We're going to go through a couple of different areas. Again, start thinking about not only the assessments that you'll make as a nurse, but also start thinking about what you need to do about it as a nurse. What are the interventions? What are your priorities? How many of you remember when you got to nursing? In biology, the que when you got a multiple choice question, there were perhaps four options and three were wrong and one was right. And when you got to nursing, four were right and your nursing instructor said to you, but you have to pick the best one. You guys remember that? Or the highest priority. Or you had to pick the first nursing intervention. That is one of the greatest challenges of the NCLEX is the fact that you may be posed with four correct answers. And so what you really need to start looking at is what your highest priorities are, what decisions and what critical thinking is going to be very important for you. So let's get started. If we could have the first slide. So multi-system stressors. Um, think about the things that are listed in your book. If you can hit it again. There we go. We're going to start by talking about stress. And I think, first of all, I know that teaching nursing students about stress is probably not a difficult thing because it's not an unfamiliar concept to you. You certainly live your life in stress. But I want you to take yourself out of it a little bit and put yourself into the nursing role. Patients are under stress all the time. Whether they are ill, whether they are injured, whether they have a family member who is ill or injured, stress is something that you as a nurse will deal with. 
And one of the things that you need to think about is how, in fact, people adapt or cope with stress. In your book, it talks about some of that coping. It talks about support systems. It talks about the ability of a patient to cope. And so in a test question, if you are asked about coping with a patient and you have a patient who's short of breath, please think about the fact that those priorities are just for that patient to take the next breath. Coping with stress is going to be very difficult for them. So anytime you have a test question that talks about a patient who is severely ill or who is very symptomatic, that patient is going to be less able to roll with the punches or deal with stress. You're going to look at the EBLs and the EBRs. What is the estimated blood lost and how much of that blood was replaced and how much fluid that patient received in the operating room. If they received 3,000 cc's of normal saline in the operating room, they might come back with a little periorbital edema. That's normal, but you're going to want to watch for urine output to ensure that they, in fact, do not retain that fluid unnecessarily. With the GI system, remember that immobility is going to decrease peristalsis and increase the risk for constipation. Also remember, many patients have vomiting as a side effect related to anesthesia. So you may have to administer antiemetics. You may have to administer routine or PRN laxatives. You may, in fact, need to get that patient up and walking. You may have to provide some alternatives for toileting. Not every patient can use the bedpan. For the, G, um, the GU system, sorry, did that in reverse order, remember that a side effect of many of the anticholinergics and anesthetic agents is urinary retention. So you're going to want to watch for bladder distension and that first post-op void. You want to make sure that, remember all those tricks you learned in maternity nursing to get a patient to void running water, put their hand in water, all of those things that may in fact stimulate spontaneous voiding. If not, many postoperative patients come back with straight catheterization orders, like if no void by eight hours postop, catheterized times two, Q4 hours. And that will allow then the body to, to um, then get over that urinary retention. Remember though, you st first want to encourage the client to be able to void on their own. Sometimes for clients, it's just a matter of being able to sit on a commode, a bedside commode, or stand at the bedside and use a urinal to spontaneously void. And then wound complications. Think about wound infection. You're going to assess the wound, assess the skin areas, assess for drainage, assess for systemic body temperature, assess for localized changes in skin temperature. You're going to want to assess for wound complications like evisceration and dehiscence. Dehiscence happens when the wound opens and evisceration happens when what is inside the wound falls out. So those are obviously things that you as a nurse would need to prevent so you don't want to put them, have them put a lot of stress on their suture line. If a patient goes to the OR for a surgical procedure that includes an extremity, you want to be real careful about doing a blood pressure in that extremity. Remember that the Dynamap or whatever electronic blood pressure cuff you use causes a pretty significant squeeze upon the vessels, and that can cause suture line stress. So you want to be really careful about that. Constrictive clothing, all of those things could increase the um, fragility of that suture area. When we talk about peds, we're going to talk about things like cleft lip and palate, but certainly any um, surgery inside the mouth or inside the nose needs to be kept clean, especially with feedings and things like that. Okay, and then certainly with wound complications, you want to think about post-operative prophylaxis with antibiotics. Most patients will have received one dose of antibiotics in the operating room. An important part of your care is to look at that in the operative report and then time the antibiotics such that you maintain therapeutic blood levels post-operatively. So not only are we assessing, but we're also preventing the infection with, uh, with um, those antibiotics. Things like nutrition, all of the things that go into safe post-operative care are certainly going to be involved there. Okay, I have four questions that I'd like you to do in this section, and those numbers are 67, 69, 74, 
and 84. 69, ooh, 67, 69, 74, and 84. And I'll give you four minutes to do those. Okay, it looks like people are done with those. Number 67, what was the answer? One, very good, gagging. Remember an artificial airway, an oral airway is only used for unconscious patients. If the patient is conscious and needs an artificial airway, you can use a nasal airway or a nasal trumpet. But artificial airways, the, what used to be called bite blocks or um, the oral pharyngeal airway can only be used for unconscious patients. Okay, how about 69? Two. Two. Very good. Remember, anytime you cough, you increase the intrathoracic pressure. All right, how about 74? Two. Two. Very good. So that's an example. I kind of alluded to that question. What are you going to do? Anytime you have a patient that, anytime you have a problem, with patient care, remember the chain of command within your um, healthcare institution. And what NCLEX usually accepts is that you first go to the charge nurse and then to the nursing supervisor. Okay, and then the last question was number 84. One. One. Very good. You're going to increase patient's mobility. The next disease we're going to talk a little bit about is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis actually happens when there is patches along the myelinization of the nerve fibers. Remember as we get older, our nerve fibers gain layers of myelin, which actually makes them more efficient at conduction. You can think about them like the layers of um, inside of a tree ring. As the tree gets older, it builds layers and layers, and that's what happens to your nerve cells. They build layers and layers, and as they get that insulation, they get more rapid in their conduction. With multiple sclerosis, there's a degeneration of that myelin sheath so that there is an interruption and there's a slowing of the nerve transmission. It affects women more than men, and there are many, many symptoms of central nervous system um, deterioration that happen with multiple sclerosis. One of the characteristic things is diplopia or double vision. They also may in fact have euphoria or mood swings and they have impaired motor function. So patients may go from being weak to paralyzed to ventilator dependent. They do something called scanning speech where they talk around a topic and they are unable to focus on the topic at hand. They may, in fact, retain their urine or become incontinent. And the way it's usually diagnosed is through a multiple amounts of differential diagnosis. So they'll rule out other diagnoses in order to come to the conclusion about MS. A lot of the care is palliative with multiple sclerosis, although one of the newer findings that, the, that they have looked at is not only looking at medications like corticosteroids, which decrease um, some of the um, inflammation, but also interferon. Interferon is a biologic response modifier that has been given for cancers that they now have found arrests some of that demyelinization process. Patients may also have plasma exchanges. It is thought that part of the reason those myelin sheaths degenerate is an antibody response. And so when they exchange the patient's plasma, it reduces the level of antibodies that are in the blood. The next diagnosis is myasthenia gravis. Myasthenia gravis is a neurological disorder, neuromuscular disorder when there's a decrease in and it causes weakness, and the major um, hormone here or neurotransmitter here is acetylcholine. So if you want to think about it, it's kind of the opposite of Parkinson's disease. There is a lack of acetylcholine, which is the, nervous the nerve transmitter that carries the impulse. And so with that lack of, of 
acetylcholine, patients are going to be very weak. Patients are, in fact, going to potentially need ventilatory support. Patients have a hard time moving or managing their secretions. And the treatment for that, if you think about it, remember what the, the suffix ASE means. ASE is an enzyme. And so when you look at it in your book, they treat this drug with anti-cholinesterase drugs. Cholinesterase is the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So by blocking the enzyme, they actually increase the level of acetylcholine. It's also called an acetylcholine agonist. Make sure that you understand that agonist is an increaser and antagonist is an inhibitor. A lot of times there's confusion about those two words. So patients are going to be on anticholinesterase medications. The ones that you've probably heard of are mestinon and prostigmin. Both of those are given to, in fact, raise the level of, cholines of acetylcholine in the body and allow for strength. Great questions could be asked, in fact, about the difference between a myasthenic crisis and a cholinergic crisis. And those are described very well in your book if you look at page 221 and 222. Remember that with a myasthenic crisis, the client becomes weak because there's not enough acetylcholine, so they'll increase the drug. With a cholinergic crisis, they have too much acetylcholine, and they, in fact, need the drug to be discontinued. OK, a little bit about head injuries. We've talked a lot about some of the different signs and symptoms of increased, and we'll talk about epilepsy when we talk about PEDS. With head injuries, it's important for you to think about, again, increased intracranial pressure, talk about the most common origin is motor vehicle accidents. Remember that the assessment findings could be things like visual disturbances or headaches, or it may be significant decreases in level of consciousness or coma. You want to monitor all those signs, and you're certainly going to want to provide client teaching. Think about the proverbial concussion. What they want to do is ensure that the patient is wakeful at um, periods to ensure that they don't have a decrease and don't sleep through a decreasing level of consciousness. All right, we're about to begin. This unit we're talking about the respiratory system, so if you can look in your books on page 286, we're going to start talking a little bit about the anatomy and physiology, and then we'll talk more about some of the disorders. If you think about the anatomy and physiology of the respiratory tract, things that you want to think about is that when the respiratory tract is intact, it in fact keeps the air warm, it filters the air, and so as air is breathed in through the nose and the pharynx, the air is filtered, it is warmed, it is moisturized. So anytime the oral pharynx or the nose are not functioning well, you in fact might have problems. And that's why you probably have thought about giving patients oxygen with humidity and the filtering that goes on. I'm going to let you look at these pictures, but I want you to think a little bit about what happens with the respiratory tract when there is pathophysiology, when the alveoli do not work, when the bronchi close off, when there is in fact a problem with the air passages. So you can look through some of those slides. Remember when there's chest wall um, problems, in fact like a stab wound or some sort of fracture in the ribs, that's going to affect the way that the bony carriage is in fact going to assist during inspiration. Remember that inspiration is active, it's a muscular response. Exhalation is passive, and when we talk about emphysema, that's going to have a lot of implications. We also need to talk about the pulmonary circulation. Yesterday, we talked quite a lot about pulmonary emboli, clots within the pulmonary system, and so you really need to make sure that the pulmonary, uh, uh, coronary arter the pulmonary arteries and veins are, in fact, assessed. There's also the problem with gas exchange, and think about gas exchange as it's working within the human body. There's going to be CO2 and oxygen exchange across the alveoli, and any time there's alveolar changes, there's going to be changes in the way that perfusion and exchange happens. So let's talk a little bit about the assessment. So the assessment of the respiratory tract. 
With the assessment, remember the biggest things you're going to do is assess respiratory rate. But remember, you're not just looking at a number. You're going to look at the depth of respirations. You're going to look at the quality of respirations. You're going to assess for adventitious breath sounds. Remember, you learned how to assess breath sounds for crackles, for ronchi. You're going to assess for rubs. You're going to assess for any differences between inspiration and expiration. And you want to assess for the length of inspiration and expiration. And certainly, you can look at that. With the throat, you're going to think about things like sore throats, dysphagia, swelling. With the lungs themselves, think about cough. Cough is one of the leading signs of respiratory dysfunction. And so you want to get some idea from the patient about their cough. Does it happen at certain times? Is it stimulated by certain activities? Does it wake them up in the middle of the night? Are there things about the cough as far as sputum production? Is there a problem, in fact, with some types of environments that stimulate coughs, like cold air versus warm air? You're going to look at dyspnea. You're going to think about what kind of shortness of breath the patient has. And I talked about this a little bit previously. Think about what the client is able to accomplish in order to maintain the work of breathing. Does the patient um, need to pause after two or three words and become dyspneic? Or is the patient allowed to get through an entire sentence? Is the patient dyspneic after getting up one flight of stairs? And actually, you'll see in many measures, they actually quantify that and measure the level of dyspnea based on what the patient is allowed to accomplish. Think about ADLs. Think about the dyspnea being associated with cyanosis. Frequently, dyspnea may or may not be associated with circumoral cyanosis, which is certainly a sign. Think about wheezing. Remember what wheezing is. Wheezing is air rushing through a narrowed airway. And so if, in fact, the airway is narrowed, it's going to, the wheeze is, in fact, going to take on a pitch. And that pitch can change based on whether it's inspiratory or expiratory, or whether it's in the upper parts of the airway or in the lower parts of the airway. So the timing of the wheeze and the quality of the wheeze is going to make a difference. Next week, when we talk about pediatrics, we're going to talk quite a lot about wheezes and coughs as they relate to the smaller airways of children, but just know that you're going to want to be able to describe the sounds of the coughs and the wheezes and the pitch and when exactly they happen and what makes them worse. Think about lifestyle. Smoking is the leading thing that you're going to want to find out about. You want to find out if there's exposure to secondary smoke. You want to find out if, in fact, there's side stream smoke. So if, in fact, they've been around smoke their whole lives, they may, in fact, not personally smoke, but that exposure could, in fact, have some um, impact. Certainly, you want to ask about occupation. We all know um, that certainly occupational exposure to things like coal dust could, in fact, change the way patients breathe. Also, things like think about exposure to pollution. Think about those people that take tolls on the, toll on the turnpikes. Certainly, they're constantly exposed to large volumes of high particulate pollution. Think about people that are exposed to asbestos. And I know you're certainly aware of the asbestosis that can happen. Um, from asbestos that's in ceiling tiles and um, insulation. Think about the way the patient, in fact, reacts to that. Do they cough every day at their work from this? You've probably also heard a lot about molds. In environments that have a lot of molds, some patients actually develop respiratory symptoms and problems and increased work of breathing simply from the molds in their environment. You want to find a little bit about where they live. Do they live in an area like Los Angeles, which is, in fact, in a deep valley surrounded by pollution? You want to find out a little bit about their exercise and their recreation. Are they able to, in fact, exercise at all? You're then going to look at their nutrition. Do they take in enough fluids? I mentioned before that fluids are an important part of facilitating secretion removal. And so if the patient's well hydrated, you're, in fact, going to find that they're going to be um, better off as far as their secretions. And then past medical history, have they gotten their immunizations? Are they on time? Did they get the flu vaccine? Are they certainly, do they have a history of lots of colds and flus? Many of the respiratory illnesses actually happen as a result of a lifetime of upper and lower respiratory infections. Things like bronchitis can actually be brought on, and when you listen to their history, they have a history of chronic respiratory infections. So we mentioned a little bit about um, duodenal ulcers already. Again, predisposing factors are very similar to gastric ulcers. 
The pain is usually, again, not until two to four, three to five hours after eating food, and that food actually makes it feel better. Gastric surgery is sometimes indicated, and one of the things that you're probably um, more familiar with gastric surgery because of bariatric surgery that's, given now, that's done now for obesity. Remember what I talked a little bit about previously, that patients that have gastrectomies will not have enough of the intrinsic factor and will need vitamin B11 and B12 injections for the rest of their lives. I mentioned a little bit about dumping syndrome, large volumes of carbohydrates hitting the stomach, especially with large volumes of liquid, can cause a dump, meaning that the food, the content of the stomach is dumped into the intestine, and that can lead to diarrhea. And so you want to make sure that you watch the patient very carefully for dumping syndrome. With cancer of the mouth, we've already, excuse me, cancer of the stomach, we've already talked a little bit about the cancers. Usually it's related to high salt foods or highly processed foods. You hear a lot about um, patient, uh, client populations that eat a lot of smoked meats, a lot of smoked fish, having high rates of cancer of the stomach. They'll tend to do uh, surgery for that, a lot of nonspecific symptoms with it, so the patients may in fact be, progress for a long time with cancer of the stomach before they're treated. We talked a little bit about the hernias, and we just said that a hernia is an, um, a protrusion of a portion of the gastric tract, whether it's the intestines or the stomach, through an abnormal opening. And certainly I'll let you look at that. The thing that you want to think most about is strangulation of the hernias. If the hernia is in fact um, tight enough, that the hole is tight enough that it causes a decrease in the blood supply to that portion of the intestine or stomach, it can cause those cells to necrose. And so it is important that a strangulated hernia be treated early on in the, in the um, existence. Intestinal obstructions, you've probably heard of this. Patients come into the hospital and the title that's given if you don't, they don't know what's on, going on is an acute abdomen. Patients come into the hospital with an acute abdomen. They may have abdominal pain. They may have distension. They may have a history of constipation. They may experience nausea and vomiting. And so what they'll do is some of the diagnostics that we talked about already, an upper or lower GI, to assess for an intestinal obstruction. Remember that patients postoperatively will have something called a paralytic ileus. It's a reaction to anesthesia, and that's why we watch so carefully for bowel sounds postoperatively. Some other dis um, illnesses, like um, certainly spinal cord injury, can lead to an ileus. Burns may lead to an ileus. And so it's important for us to assess for bowel function. Frequently, some, um, usually there will be no stool. But remember, if in fact the patient has an obstruction low in the colon, watery or thin stools may in fact be able to get around it. And so sometimes the patient exam, um, has symptoms of an intestinal obstruction and yet has a history of diarrhea. So the patient needs to be assessed well. All right, a couple of the disorders that are probably very familiar to you are the chronic inflammatory bowel diseases. And we're gonna talk about a couple of them. The first one is Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is a, a fairly common inflammatory bowel disease. It can infect anywhere in the colon, both, but most commonly affects um, the um, portions of the colon that are kind of the wrap around, so the ascending, the transverse, and the descending parts of the colon. There are granulomas that uh, um, happen along the, co the colon wall, and you'll hear about the word, you'll hear cobblestone appearance. Those granulomas make little um, pillows of tissue in between which there are fissures. Those fissures tend to bleed. It is more, more common in the Jewish population, and the cause is really unknown, although there are some food allergy and familial tendencies. Patients are going to have a lot of abdominal tenderness and pain. They may have nausea and vomiting. And again, I mentioned this before. They may have diarrhea and may have soft, bloody stools. Treatment can be a couple of different things. They may put the patient and just try and manage with diet. They're going to put them on a milk-free diet. Remember that milk is very high in lactose. 
and lactose can in fact cause that high carbohydrate dumping syndrome we talked about before. So it is thought that patients that require, um, that are on a, uh, have a lot of diarrhea should not get free milk. They can eat cheese, but they cannot eat the free milk. Okay, they may also be on antimicrobials, they may be on the anticholinergics or anti-diarrhea agents, anything that'll shunt blood away from the colon and decrease some of the peristalsis. Patients with Crohn's disease, Crohn's disease can be critically ill. They can develop fluid and electrolyte imbalances. They can develop some arthritic changes along with their disease. And sometimes patients cannot eat at all and they have to rest the bowel totally with total parenteral nutrition. They may, in fact, have a portion of the bowel um, resected. And again, certainly there's a whole lot of um, bowel surgeries that are done. It is very common to have, for patients to have colostomies in order to manage the Crohn's disease. And let's contrast that with osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is relieved by rest. Most older adults experience some level of osteoarthritis, and it can affect any of the joints. It tends to hit the weight-bearing joints first. So the spine, the knee, the ankles, and the hips are usually hit first. But it can also affect the fingers, depending on how much mobility the patients um, have. It's also known to have an increased incidence with patients that are obese because of the wear and tear on the joints. And the incidence certainly increases with age. Pain is usually the um, leading symptom. There may be what's called Heberden's nodes. Heberden's nodes are an increase in size of the joints. And you may have seen this in patients um, in their fingers. It may actually cause some displacement of the end of the finger and actually cause the fingers to be somewhat crooked. Those Heberden's nodes are those enlargements. They're gonna have a decreased range of motion. They may have crepidation. Remember that sounds upon movement. And certainly patients are usually diagnosed based on their age and their symptoms, but X-ray will certainly find those calcifications and the sed rate may be slightly in, um, elevated if there's some inflammatory element. So what are the nursing interventions for these patients? Well, the first thing is obviously relieving some of the pain. Again, these patients may take chronic NSAIDs, so we worry about their belly. They may use assistive devices to walk, like canes or walkers. If the patient is obese, they're encouraged to lose weight. The patients are, in fact, encouraged to move to toleration, but they're also encouraged to rest. And one of the things that can happen is they frequently may have hip and leg involvement and sometimes, or back involvement, it's enough to just raise one foot on a stool and change the weight-bearing pressure, and that'll decrease some of the back pain. Again, patients with arthritis really prefer hot pads, but ice is sometimes effective. And again, you wanna encourage rest, range of motion, a well-balanced diet, and then heat and ice as ordered. Okay, gout, a little bit different from those. Gout is, used to be called the disease of the kings. It comes from rich living. Back in the king's days when they used to eat meals with about 6,000 calories per meal, the patients used to develop gouty changes in their body. The gouty changes come from diets high in purine, and that's the heavy meats and alcohol. Hence, that's why it was called the disease of the kings. The uric acids build up in the joints, and it creates gouty changes, especially in the feet and legs. Early on, patients' changes usually happen in the toes, and they end up having very pain, significant pain in the toes from the uric acid crystals. It happens more in males, and there is some familial tendency. So they're going to have joint pain and redness, especially in the big toe. They're going to have potentially some systemic effects of headaches and anorexia. They may actually have um, tachycardia, 
and they may actually have swelling in areas of the outer ear and of the feet. Diagnostically, it's usually done by symptoms and the clinical picture, but again, they can do a uric acid level to see what the uric acid level's like. And we already talked about the treatment of this. If you look at the two different medications that are usually ordered, they are colchicine or allopurinol. And the way I always remember this is colchicine has the C, and it's done for acute attacks. And allopurinol is done for chronic gout. So the A's and the C's don't match up. So colchicine is done in, a, in the event of an acute attack. And they'll actually titrate the, the colchicine based on the patient's symptoms. Colchicine is known to cause significant diarrhea. They also will give agents like xyloprim we've talked about to prevent future gouty attacks. And a low purine diet is recommended. Low in meats, especially fatty meats, and stopping drinking alcohol.